Brookside. Welcome to Brookfield. I'm Clara Sider, Chairman of the A Commission here at Brookfield. I, mean, I have to quickly give two shouts out to Brookfield Community Access uh, Media because in the last two months we've had an egg presentation and we had a forestry or a, a fruit tree presentation and we have 93 people viewing those different programs over the last two months. So that's just awesome and thank you to Brookfield Community Media for taking our stuff and getting it around town. So with that, unless there's anything from uh, the Brookfield Committee that we, we're going to move away from regular orders to uh, host the Worcester County Ag Commissions. You're on. Thank you. Punk, is it? Yeah, punk, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Ann Starbird from Sterling. And um, the Sterling AgCom, as well as Worcester County Conservation District, and since we have so many new people, new faces in our room tonight, um, just a little overview on what we do. The Worcester County Conservation District started hosting quarterly at a quarterly meetings of Worcester County AgComs, probably now about four years ago. Um, so it's great. We we took the show on the road. We were meeting in Holden. Took the show on the road um, in January with um, the Westminster AgCom hosted the quarterly meeting. It's great to be here in Brookfield, and we kind of hope to keep um, spreading this group. It's a great group for um, it's a great group for sharing information, problems, networking, this and that. We usually have a topic, and our topic tonight is going to be the the value added products and food safety awareness. Um, so what I like to do by starting out is to quickly go around the room, say who you are, where you're from, and if you have any little side comments, we like to try to keep this moving along. So um, we'll start right here in the front with Ron. Uh, I'm Ron Starcher from, the, from Brookfield. I'm on the Brookfield Lady of Commission too. I'm Chris Dostardia from Templeton, Mass. I'm on the Agricultural Commission there. Um, Westminster um, Agcom ML Alphabelli. Dick Lamro, Lamro Greenhouse, Brookfield. Paul Benjamin, Brookfield Ag Commission. Ken Cleveland, Brookfield Ag Commission. Going to have one, Brookfield Ag Commission. Paul Benjamin. Ashley Duray, Rutland Ag Commission. Morning, you bring the number again. Thank you, Allison. Jim Doe, Brookfield Ag Commission. Soon to be in the town on both poles and Brookfield Clark side. Barbara Bradley, Brookfield Ag Commission. I'm Grace Roy, I'm from Brookfield. Happy Swart, Bedford Farms, Brookfield. Dick Williams, Rutland Ag Commission. Cindy Thompson, Riverness Farm, Brookfield. Bill Dobson, Brookfield. Carrie Metcalf from the Bridge Commission. Scott Metcalf from the Bridge Commission. Mike Pennyhouse, Chairman of the Commission, Vice President of Mass Association of Ag Commission. My wife, Amy. Finney. Uh, I'm Finney from Australia Ag Commission. And we have two that tried to pretend they weren't here tonight, but can you just introduce yourself? Me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Frank Olmo, uh, Red River Farm and Landscape Supply. And that was the newcomers. Right. <laughs> Sorry, you got to say who you are. Andre Chadier from the Templeton Ag Commission. Uh, <clears throat> Matt Clerk, Valley Farm and Templeton Ag Commission. All right, great. Well, this is great to see so many <clears throat> new faces and uh, for representing new, new towns at our quarterly ag meeting. Um, again, for those of you, I'm Ann Starbird from Sterling um, and the Worcester County Conservation District. So we're going to head right on to our program for this evening. We have um, Ron Starcher, from, <coughs> who's here in Brookfield, and he's going to share with us information, um, an overview of the food safety regulations for value-added products. Um, these are lessons that he learned from a recent experience uh, expanding his jelly and pickle business. He runs town farm gardens and ships about 70 cases of jams, jellies, and other preserved in January alone, and installed a new kitchen, meeting all codes and standards in 2014, which was, I'm sure, no light endeavor. So, Ron, turn the... Okay. 
Uh, let me preface this by saying I don't know, this is going to be a broad overview. Uh, this is what we had to go through and uh, some of the other things that I learned along the way that maybe didn't apply to us, but we learned. There's a lot of regulations. I go to a lot of farmers markets that have a lot of people who are not following the regulations. And at some point along here, I hope I can tell you why some of those regulations are in there and why maybe you ought to ask people at farmers markets whether they are uh, following some of these regulations. You find all the buttons on, on the computer. Uh, what is controlled by these regulations is any food intended for human consumption that's not in its raw state. So vegetables that you take out of the field and don't do anything with, have no federal regulation other than the new Food Safety and Modernization Act stuff. But uh, if you take uh, a head of lettuce and make a tossed salad out of it, just rip up the leaves, put it in a gallon baggie, you are then starting to be controlled by the uh, federal uh, food code. A lot of people don't know that, and a lot of farmers are selling things, you know, sliced uh, melons and things like that. If you slice a melon, it's not in its raw state anymore, you should be following the food code. Let's say you have to do it in a commercial kitchen in order to slice it and package it and take it to a farmer's market. Uh, if you're making jams and jellies, if you're making sauces, uh, baked goods, uh, I, and I see a lot of these things from the farms, people make jams from things that they grow on their farm all the time. If you want to sell it at a farmer's market, there are regulations that you have to follow. Uh, and then the, the hardest one is the canned and preserved foods other than jams and jellies, which are pickles, tomato sauce, salsas. Uh, I am not talking about foods that are containing meat or meat products or dairy products. Those are USDA and not FDA. I had nothing to do with those and do not pretend to know anything about those, nor do I want to. <laughs> I, I've had enough trouble with the FDA and I don't want to start dealing with the USDA about this stuff. Uh, in general, all uh, value-added products need to be done, need to be manufactured in a regulated kitchen. And it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial kitchen, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, can everybody see that okay? It's kind of light here. It was nice when I did it. Uh, if you're supplying samples, letting people taste your, your uh, products, uh, you should have uh, a food safety manager who's been gone through the surf safe program. Uh, the FDA and the state the uh, Department of Public Health both recommend that everybody that's serving the public go to allergen awareness training. It costs 10 bucks, it takes about half an hour, uh, it's all online, and it's really easy. Please. It's kind of informative. But. Uh, everyone who is doing business, uh, and again, this is another one that most people don't do. You should get a business license from your town if you're not if you're doing business on something other than your own name. If you are do if you're a Fred Smith builder, even though your name is Fred Smith, if it's Fred Smith building is your thing, you should, you have to have a business license. If you're not doing business with just your name, uh, you should also no matter what, it's probably a good thing to get a uh, state sales tax uh, number, uh, even if you're just selling non-taxable items, fresh fruit, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of times that the uh, state comes around and asks for uh, to see everybody's resale numbers and sometimes you can get away with it saying I don't have anything for resale but if you have anything that might be taxable that you're selling, it can be more that. And that's free again too, so it's easy to do. Uh, again, this is general regulations regardless of what you sell. Uh, things that you should be doing is uh, there are minimum requirements for labeling. Uh, in the highlights here are all of the things that are their minimum requirements for a label. Uh, 
And if you have a look at most farmers markets, you won't see all of these things on the label, but this is a federal law that's been adopted by Massachusetts. So it should have the name of the product on there. Uh, that if the name of the product is not the common name, if you're calling it, uh, I don't know, zippy sauce and it's tomato sauce, it has to say <coughs> tomato sauce someplace on there so people know what it is. Uh, you have to have the net contents, uh, and if it's a liquid, it should be in volume. If it's a solid, it has to be in weight. If it's a semi-solid, it has to be in weight. If it's highly viscous, it has to be in weight. So ketchup, even though it pours out mostly really easily, you'll notice on the bottle it's in, uh, it's in weight, it's not in ounces. Uh, you'll see a lot of people selling jams and jellies that have eight ounce jars that they say eight ounces on them. That's fluid ounces and it probably doesn't weigh eight ounces. Uh, you have to have a list of all the ingredients on there. Uh, they're listed in order of prominence by weight, so the most uh, common ingredient by weight should be first and the scarcest ingredient by weight is last. <coughs> ingredients containing food allergens, of which there are seven major allergens, uh, must have that allergen listed parenthetically after it. So if you are making bread and one of your ingredients is flour, you must have parentheses wheat if you use wheat flour because wheat is one of the major allergens. Uh, if you use nuts in it, uh, like we use amaretto in some of our uh, jams, we have to put parentheses almonds because it's a nut. Uh, amaretto is made out of almonds. Uh, you, you have to have the nutrition information on it. Uh, most people that you see around don't have nutrition information on it. There is a small business waiver you can get from the FDA. <coughs> it is granted automatically, but you should. You have to apply for it if you're going to not put nutrition information on it. You make less than 10,000 units a year. Excuse me, less than 10,000 units a year. You don't have to put nutrition information on it. Log on to the FDA website, tell them you're a small business and you want an exemption, and they will automatically grant it. So uh, we did that a few years ago when we were less than 10,000 units. Uh, they also have to have your manufacturer name, address, and phone number on there. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. The, the law says you don't have to put your address on it if you are listed in the, uh, if your business is listed in the phone book, since there are not many phone books around anymore. It's, it, it doesn't say anything about the internet, so I don't know what the rules are for that, but it, it wants name, address, and phone number, unless you're in the phone book. Then you only put your name and phone number. Uh, Massachusetts is pretty lucky in that uh, we are one of the minority of states that allows you to cook in residential kitchens and sell. Uh, like places like Connecticut, you can't do uh, residential kitchens and sell to the public. You are allowed to make uh, non-potentially hazardous foods in residential <coughs> kitchens for sale to the public. Uh, you have to have the state or the local board of health uh, bless your kitchen and it's pretty easy. We started out doing that. Uh, basically, they come in and just say, did you meet some minimum standards for uh, cleanliness in your kitchen? The caveat being that you can only use manufactured non-potentially hazardous foods. The easy definition of non-potentially hazardous foods is if you can store it overnight on the counter with nothing bad happening to it, it's not potentially hazardous, which is usually uh, baked goods. Uh, it, they also apply it to jams and jellies because jams and jellies are uh, so far past the, we'll get to what the safe standards are, are so far past the safe standards that you can really mess up jelly and still have it be pretty safe. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, in order to get your kitchen to pass, you don't have to do anything extra to it to be a residential kitchen. We didn't have to do anything. We got a 200 year old house. So. Uh, so these are some of the things you cannot make. These are, these are, would be potentially hazardous things that uh, the state was kind enough to uh, volunteer for me. 
on their website. So cream-filled pastries, because you can't leave them on the counter overnight, they have to be refrigerated. Cheesecake, anything requiring refrigeration and anything uh, that are controlled under federal law. Acidified and low, and low acid foods, and we'll get to those. And interstate sales of anything produced in a commercial kitchen are prohibited because the state that you're going to may not allow residential kitchens. Next is uh, commercial kitchens, uh, which is what we wound up a couple of years ago. I don't, it wasn't in 2014. I don't remember what year it was. 2012, maybe, we put in our uh, commercial kitchen. Uh, we put it in the back of our house. Uh, it was a, uh, it's a dedicated facility uh, just for cooking. You can't cook for your home. You, if, in order for you to have a commercial kitchen in your house, you have to have a residential kitchen also. You cannot cook for your home in the commercial kitchen. So you're required to have a commercial kitchen for uh, all potentially hazardous foods. It doesn't have to be in your home. You can go uh, rent uh, commercial kitchens. Some of the churches around have commercial kitchens that you can go to. Uh, a lot of restaurants will let you cook there off hours if you want to uh, lease their facility. Uh, Again, you can't use it for personal cooking. And there are a lot of special requirements for commercial kitchens if you were gonna put one in that we found out about, much to our chagrin, several of them after we had gotten well underway. Uh, I won't go into those now because I don't wanna be accused of missing something and have somebody come back and yell at me. But uh, be advised that there's a plumbing code for commercial kitchens, there's an electrical code. Uh, our building inspector had a few other things that he uh, was nice enough to tell us that we had to do. So just uh, be aware if you're gonna go off and do this on your own that there's, it, it took a little bit more than we thought it would when we got started. And now this is what we're doing, what we're good at was uh, acidified foods and then low acid canned foods. Acidified foods uh, is what we make, that's pickles, uh, salsa, relish. It's any food that does not uh, have a pH of 4.6 or less naturally. Uh, let me digress a minute uh, about the four points. I, I learned a lot lately. Uh, one of the things in order to become an acidified food processor is you have to take a class. The federal government makes you take a class uh, called Better Process Control, that, uh, part of which, a big part of which, is microbiology of the bad bugs that grow in food. And one of the things you learn is that uh, the magic number of 4.6 means that most bugs, if you kill them or cause them to go dormant will not reappear if the acid is, if the pH is 4.6 or less. One of the bugs that you can't kill when you're processing uh, pickles and things like that is Clostridium botulinum. C. botulinum is the most deadly toxin in the world. One nanogram will kill you. So the, the thing I learned the other day, just happened to be watching a show on the five most deadly toxins in the world, that a grain of, sand, of uh, botulinum, a, a botulinum toxin the size of a grain of sand, can kill uh, 96,000 people. So it doesn't take much for botulism to hurt you. If, when, we process, when we process foods, we are not killing Clostridium botulinum we are making it go dormant. We have to assure that the pH is below 4.6 in order to make, make sure that it stays dormant. If it should come back uh, into its uh, normal bacterial state, it will start producing the toxins and it doesn't take much to have, it, have adverse effects. Consequently, uh, every single batch of every single thing we make, we have to measure the pH of. We have to keep a log. Uh, the state's kind enough to come in once a year and look at our log. They look at the calibration records for our pH meters. Uh, we have uh, 
you know, hazard analysis and control plans, all kinds of stuff. But it, it is, uh, it, it can be a little bit daunting. And then once you understand the reasons that they put those controls in place, you understand why they make you do these things. So get to start off with, I, here are some foods that are naturally acidic. So these are naturally below 4.6. Mangoes, cranberries, oranges, and some tomatoes. Only about half the tomatoes that are grown today are below 4.6. So when people make tomato sauce, lots of people make tomato sauce and can it. If you're just doing a regular canner, putting it in boiling water canner, and it's not below 4.6, you are taking a chance. Uh, the next list is things that are naturally not below 4.6. So Cucumbers, beans, onions, peppers, cabbage, and most tomatoes. That's why pickles are pickled in, in vinegar, because that's a, vinegar has a pH of about two, so it uh, makes the, the net pH of the cucumber and the uh, vinegar at uh, some number below 4.6. Ours comes out about 3.8, so. Uh, these are just some of the things that uh, people are making that are acidified foods. Uh, also, you'll see these a lot of farmers markets and guaranteed that 75% uh, of the people that are selling them don't know the things that we're talking about today. Uh, these are things that are required for doing acidified foods and then uh, low acid canned foods are things that are not acidified if they're uh, if they don't get below 4.6 and you still want to can them, you can. It's the canning process is about 250 degrees for 45 minutes or so in order to make them safe, which makes it turn to mush usually. But a lot of the Campbell's soups and things like that, that those are low acid canned foods. They go through a process of they're put in the can and they're put in a, uh, uh, what essentially is a pressure canner for about 45 minutes. So they're cooked in that for a long time and that actually kills a bunch of them. Uh, all certified foods need to be made in a commercial kitchen. Uh, the processing facility must be uh, registered with the FDA. So when our commercial kitchen got finished, we had to send up a whole bunch of forms to the FDA and register our facility. Uh, we have to take a federally approved course. There's uh, like seven or eight universities around the country that offer a uh, better process control. Uh, if the university has a food and nutrition science program, usually they offer this course. Uh, university of Maine, Cornell, University of Georgia, UC Davis are some of the big ones around. Uh, another relatively onerous requirement is that every single product in every single packaging size that you want to sell has to be tested and the test results submitted to the FDA for approval. So we sell uh, seven or eight varieties of pickles, six varieties of salsa, uh, half a dozen relishes. Every single one of those went to a lab. We paid for a lab test. Uh, we paid for uh, some other, somebody to do some modeling that comes up with the least sterilizing value that I still don't know that I really understand what it is, but it's the, it, it's essentially the odds that anything lived through our process. All of that gets put together, submitted to the FDA, and then uh, if they feel like it in a week or two or a month or two, they'll let you know that you passed. I haven't had any rejected except for the first one because I didn't know about least sterilizing value, but they told me. Uh, if you change the recipe, packaging size, shape, or batch size, you have to start over again. So we went, we had salsa that we were selling in eight ounce jars. Uh, people kept telling us they needed more salsa, so we wanted to go to 12 ounce jars, uh, which is the Tostitos jar. So we bought some Tostitos jars, and we had to go through a whole another batch of testing and submittals with the uh, 12 ounce jar. Uh, we have to have a HACCP plan for each product, uh, hazard analysis and critical control point plan, which is uh, 
you have to figure out where things can go wrong in your process and how are you going to find out if they did. Uh, there's only two or three critical control points in our process. Most of them we can figure out, you know, did, did we process it? Uh, it did, did the lid seal? That's a critical control point. If it doesn't seal, it's not a good, you know, we can tell. We have a way to figure that out. Did we acidify it enough? We have a way to tell that. We're going to measure the pH. And anything that's on your HESA plan as a critical control point, you have to keep a log. Every batch that we make, we have to, yes, we did all of this stuff. Uh, we have to keep records for everything, and they come back and look at us once a year, uh, look at all our records. Uh, again, low acid canned foods are uh, anything that doesn't have it, uh, pH of 4.6 or less. Uh, we don't have any of those. We, I don't think we could uh, actually ever do anything like that. Uh, those are usually big commercial manufacturers that have big processing facilities that can do that because 250 degrees is hard to do for 45 minutes. If you're doing a pressure canner, you can do two or three jars for in 45 minutes and it doesn't make sense to do that. Uh, if you want to sell wholesale, uh, you need to talk to the state. Uh, you can, with a residential kitchen, uh, sell wholesale. There is a residential kitchen wholesale permit that the, the state will get involved. They'll come and inspect your kitchen once again and charge you 300 bucks to do it. Uh, they come back every year and visit me and ask for a check every year. That, I, that's probably why they come back is to make sure that I give them a check. But, uh, the state also requires that we have a recall plan. So we have uh, lot numbers that we assign to every batch that we make and we have to have a way of saying, telling what uh, retail outlet our each batch went to and should they find anything wrong, we would be able to find out where they were and be able to recall them. And again, $300 a year, the most important part. Uh, this is just some commentary now. Uh, I have talked to a lot of home canners. I was not a home canner. My wife was. Uh, she got into business doing this and uh, turned out to be highly lucrative and she hired me. Uh, I take care of all the paperwork for her and I go to all the farmers markets for her. But, and sometimes she lets me wash jars and she lets me wash the dishes and things. But. Going to a lot of farmers markets, I talk to a lot of people and say, oh yeah, I make jelly and I don't even have to process mine because as soon as I pour the jelly in, put the lid on, it seals. So I don't process it. Uh, just because your jar is sealed doesn't make it safe. You haven't, in order to make the bugs, Clostridium botulinum, go dormant, you have to process it for, it has to be at uh, 200 degrees for 10 minutes. So, it just, for anybody out there, if you're doing it at home, just because the jar is sealed, you still have to process it. It's not, it's not safe just because of that. Uh, always follow a trusted recipe. If you're doing it at home, uh, use ball or somebody like ball. Uh, th there are a number of, uh, actually there's a whole lot of good recipes that the uh, University of Georgia has the home canning center and they have thousands of tested recipes. Grandma's recipe, however, uh, just because grandma did it and lived doesn't necessarily make it a good recipe. Uh, some of the things that it could have been is if if grandma was growing tomatoes and they were high acid tomatoes and she was making this fantastic tomato sauce, she, her stuff might have been great. However, if you're using uh, a low acid tomato because they taste better and don't give you as much uh, upset stomach, you could be having a uh, tomato sauce that is not at 4.6 or less. So. It's always best to use a recipe. If you look at the ball recipes for spaghetti sauce and things like that, they always add vinegar or lemon juice or something like that to it to make sure that the pH gets down to where it needs to be. Uh, if you're going to a farmer's market, I would suggest, uh, not just for my own benefit, but I would suggest that you ask 
whoever's making that, if they are a regulated, if they are federally regulated, uh, a certified food processor. There are a lot, uh, most local boards of health are not familiar with this. Uh, I know that because I dealt with ours and we didn't know about it for a while. The state, when we started doing the commercial kitchen, was the one that got us involved in this. So there's a lot of people that have, there are a lot of people making pickles in residential kitchens because the residential kitchen is uh, the, uh, pretty common in Massachusetts now that are making and selling things at farmers markets that they are not allowed to be selling and could potentially be unsafe. They're using grandma's tomato sauce recipe. Uh, and it wouldn't hurt to ask if they have a certified kitchen too, because there's a lot of people around that are just farmers and making stuff to sell at farmers markets. And that's all I have for tonight. Any questions now? I'll, I'll do my best. So, Ron, back to your water source, the EP or anybody like that, uh, public water supply, did, did any of that come up through the process? Uh, there is a <clears throat> state regulation. The, if you get water from town water, they will ask for the town water report. If you have well water, we have well water we have to get our well tested. We do not use any of our well water in any of our products, so we had a significantly less rigorous test protocol to go through. We only use it for washing. Our well water tastes horrible and we don't want our products to taste horrible, so we don't use it. We only use bottled water. But uh, annually you have to have your well water tested, and if you're using the product, you have to go through a pretty rigorous panel of testing if you're just using it for washing, like we are, uh, it's a, there's only three things you have to have tested. Anybody else? Can you sure. Um, so the Mass Department of, what, what is the department that inspects? Uh, DPH, Department of Public Health. Public Health. And is there a particular division that's commercial kitchen division, or like how, who would somebody contact? Uh, the, the state doesn't do commercial kitchens. Your local board of health local does that. Of health do that. The state gets involved when you want to wholesale. Otherwise, anything else, if you're selling it yourself, it's just your local board of health. Okay. So our board of health, until we started selling wholesale to some, we started getting, decided we want to sell to a couple of stores and we didn't need a wholesale food permit, which we were going a couple of years just selling at farmer's markets. And we never got involved with the state. All the paperwork and everything that you sent in, can you do that electronically or is that all snail mail? Uh, most of it can be done electronically. I'm trying to think. Uh, all the testing stuff uh, is, you have to, I mean, you have to send out samples and they have to, they send me back hard copies. All the submittals to the FDA, I scan it and send it in and they have electronic form. You can send it hard copy, they have a method for doing that, but it takes a lot longer. And is there one test, um, you know, is there a list of places that you can get tested or is it your UMass or when you send your... Uh, I don't package? think there's anybody in Massachusetts that's a, it's, uh, the, the tests that are required, the way, the, what we found was any university that has a food and nutrition science program has the capability of doing the testing and they will know what to do. Uh, we found out a lot when we first, when we had our first product sent out to be tested we got a whole lot of information back with the test results about, I mean, the, our first product passed, but there was a whole lot of other stuff. You know, he told us how to get a hold of the FDA and you know, who, what we had to do and that kind of stuff. Uh, there, there, most of the labs that are in Massachusetts, the commercial labs are there for testing water and things like that. They're not t for testing food. So it's gonna be a food science lab. Cornell in New York is the biggest local one. Don't tell anybody we use University of Maine because they're about half price, but uh, UC Davis and 
uh, Georgia with the Home Canning Center is another big facility for that kind of stuff. Hmm? When you're talking about the permitting process, I should add that some communities such as Brookfield require a special permit to sell items out of your home. It's not true for all residential districts or business districts, but... Yes, that's true. It's one of the things that, that we lucked out at is we're a farm, so we get to bypass a lot of regulations. Uh, you know, there, there's a Massachusetts law that says that uh, towns cannot pass zoning ordinances that restrict uh, manufacture sale, uh, advertising, all kinds of stuff uh, for products produced on the farm, which I've waved in the face of uh, several officials in the town several times. So, okay. that's yes, that's true. Right. That's true. If you, yeah, there, I, I know. I just somebody in town just went through that. That uh, decided to upgrade their facility and then got shut down because they didn't tell the town they were upgrading. More, more likely, they didn't know, which is yeah. what I'm mentioning. It's always good yes. to check. Fines and penalties for failure to comply. Uh, I don't know. I, I have heard of, I, I know the FDA has confiscated uh, all of the product produced uh, on a farm that was not a registered acidified food processor. Uh, we were just, we happened to know the people and we were trading uh, business uh, advice on making and selling things. And uh, somehow they came up on the FDA's radar and they stopped by there and they had a, they have a big farm stand there in Berlin. And they took everything they had and went looking for everything they had made. So I don't, nothing else happened to them other than they got shut down and all of their product confiscated. Are these uh, particularly new regulations, or have these things been in effect for a while? Uh, the, the acidified food and <laughs> low acid canned food, uh, believe it or not, was proclamated in the uh, Bioterrorism Act of 2001. So immediately after 9-11, we had the Bioterrorism Act. Somehow this got put into that. I don't know how that is, but uh, also, just let me... Uh, Let's see if I can get back. If you look on uh, all, if anybody who wants, by the way, uh, I, if you want to contact me, I'm Ron at townfarmgardens.com. That's uh, where you can get. If you want me to email you a copy of the presentation, I will be happy to do so. I got it. If, if, any, if you need it, just let me okay. know. But uh, what I want to point out is at the bottom of every uh, page, is the, uh, you see, that's the regulation that uh, is referred to up in the uh, text up there. It's also, that's a hyperlink, so if you have the presentation on your computer and you click on that, it'll take you to that regulation, so. <laughs> and some of them you'll see are, uh, these are federal regulations, 21 CFR 108 and 21 CFR 113. Uh, some of them are state, uh, things like the home kitchen one is a state regulation. So a lot of these regulations came in with 2001? In 2001, yes. Okay. And so this isn't the new... Um, it's not FISMA. Thank you. No. Uh, that, that, no. No. So this isn't FISMA. This is, that's, that's not for evaluated food. That's for raw food. Okay. So that's fruit and vegetables you're growing on your farm. I'm not too involved with that because we don't sell uh, raw fruits and vegetables anymore because we use it all for... <coughs> Anybody else? Okay. Let me get out of the way. Thank you, Ron. Um, and I'll make sure Lisa Trotto, who's our Worcester County Conservation District Administrator, and she emails the AgComs, she'll get a copy of this. Um, and if anybody, everybody can contact Lisa to get a copy as well. I'm a cheese maker, and I started in 1998 making cheese. And um, 
the regulations that we deal with as a cheese maker, they're quite involved. But listening to your story, I'm a glad I'm a cheese maker, I think. <laughs> you know? That's something else. Um, thank you very much. It was, I'd say, very informative and hopefully not to scare anybody from processing these things, but we do need to be involved and have our politicians also understand, you know, the importance of, of regulations. And like, I, was, I was happy to hear you say there are reasons behind things and people can get sick, so there are good reasons for the regulations too. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, have a little discussion on some of our topics that we've discussed in the past and I'm going to count call on a few people to maybe give some input on this. I'd like to get a, an update on the Central Mass Grown. We had our January meeting was about some Central Mass Grown information and they had a big kickoff um, in, help me out here with the date, in March. Yeah, just it was yeah. a big kickoff the end of March. So I'll turn the floor over to... The interim chairman of Central Mass Grown. <laughs> the ugly guy from the <laughs> So, it was. It was, it was yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm back, I'm back on stage. But uh, so, so we did. I actually had the press release here. If anybody wants to see the uh, press release and whatnot, that uh, was from Central Mass Grove. But our uh, co-chairman Vinny is here with the, the sign, so that if you did sign up for the, the program, you have books to take away, and you have signs to take away, you have bumper stickers to take away, and uh, the challenge that I gave everyone that had signed up and as part of the book and everything, is to go find somebody else. Because this is a top shelf quality, and, and, and the folks that we, we, we've been working so closely with Central Mass Regional Planning and Massachusetts Regional Planning to be able to have the kind of funding. It was basically a $100,000 effort, 20,000 originally from Central Mass Regional Planning, 60,000 grant from the state, and then another 18,000 going to be shared between Massachusetts Regional Planning and Central Mass regional planning to put put the wheels on this thing. So we've, we've been in business now for six months. We still have our 501c3 to get done, and we'll stay under the shadows of CMRPC or Montesquieu's regional planning to make sure we're, we're getting up and going. But a year from now, I would hope that we would be a sustaining organization to represent you. And uh, again, back to Ron and his presentation and whatnot to do the lobbying and those kinds of things, but educating. Uh, in fact, tonight, uh, we, we'll get credit for having this presentation because we'll tuck it underneath one of the grants that we went and applied for as, as something. So uh, again, take books if you haven't. I'm just outline what the book is. Oh yeah, okay, so yeah. So the, so the first 100 pages, or not 100 pages, but the first, uh, oh yeah, you can see my picture on page four. I, I knew what we'd do. My picture's on page four. And a quote, how's that? All right, but then beyond that, there is some true history. <laughs> And then we have some acknowledgments. I mean, the legislators have been really terrific about this thing. I mean, it, w it went from a couple of people saying, yeah, we'll help, to all, all the folks listed up here on the top of the page uh, jumping in. And again, we got 60,000 bucks. We have a meeting tomorrow with the Commissioner of Agriculture to, to see where we're going to go next as far as all of the bi-locals within the Commonwealth. And I just think it's, I, I think we've got folks' attention. So we have some uh, events and festivals that people knew about. Uh, we then have from town to town the different farms that are listed. There are about 100 farms that are listed here. Then we get to the different businesses. And Frank, did you sign up for a business or a farm? I can't remember. I can't remember. But, but you're in here. And so we, we have a bunch of, and, and there's a map here in the center. And, and again, the challenge that I would then, the, the, inviting one more person would be really a terrific idea. But the other thought is there's a map in the center fold here that tells you who jumped in and jumped on board. And I'd like to have everybody a heavy green by next year if we can. And then... There is what, a competition between the towns. The, no, <laughs> really? Yes. Is the Westminster in the house yes. or something? Yes, Sterling has done a yes. really good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Brookfield Shade is not too green, but anyway, there. Uh, but, but again, restaurants and the like, um, 
some recipes, the Granges, you know, just different contact information. But those that didn't get in the book this time, you know, for 75 bucks for next time, you can get on the website already and then you'll be part of this distribution of, of things that are happening. But again, it's just to keep the networking going. I think that that's our number one goal is to network one another, help one another. Ron was here tonight, he told some sad stories, but let's turn the positive around. <laughs> That uh, if, if, if a church wants to put in a commercial kitchen, one of the comments or conversations tomorrow morning with the commissioner will be about commercial kitchens. And yes, sir. What, what, what is Worcester County? Kind of third and what? Sixth in the country. In the, oh, in sixth? Sixth Did in the country. Did since last week? Because I thought yeah. we were. No, no, no. Not, uh, I'll find your yeah. third, but anyway. But, yeah. but we're six in the country. Six in the country for direct our Direct sales? Is that direct sales from farm, farm to consumer. Country, Worcester County. Worcester County. Okay, so now yeah. back. It's really well, oh, it's, it gets so better. better. Oh, pardon me. That's why it was so weird that when you looked at the state of Massachusetts, there were these bi local groups everywhere except the center. There was this huge hole, and that's why. That's, we don't like to brag. But the other thing is, back to those politicians, and when you're talking to them, the, probably the bigger thing will get them, not that six in the country, they kind of get. They will lose that one. But Worcester Chamber did a study of the county and of the economies in the county two years ago. And what do you think the, first, the number one economy in growth rate was? The ag segment. Smallest of what they studied, but we are the fastest growing. So let's put kids to work, get them off the farms, onto the farms. And, and go from there. So anyway, any questions about this? I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, Brooke, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, this came up at our meeting. Um, I'm on the Rutland Act Commission, and we considered joining as a member. Um, and I talked to Zalina about this at one meeting, but our budget is not huge, as I would imagine everybody else's is. So 100 bucks for us is a significant chunk of our annual budget. Is there a, a chance of creating another no, easier. option? No, easier. And again. Because we want to support you, but. Here's, here's how you can help. I mean, and again, we have ag commissions with a couple of bucks in the bank. We have ag commissions that don't have a set in the bank. And, and that's understood. The, the better idea is to get your information. The grains aren't, the granges aren't in here, but they're listed. Brookfield didn't contribute, but a number of us did contribute. So we're listed in there as, as our contact information. Yeah, we're coming, all right? And for you, you're networking. That's all good. So just keep going. Perfect. And if you get 75 bucks from the bank in a year or so, and you think that that's a good idea for spending the money, spend the money. But for now, get it. Get just be the networking facility. Yes, sir. Or, no. Good. All right. So anything Central Mass grown, you can yell at me or Fanny or others. But uh, we're going to have our first uh, kickoff election of, of the new board in April. I think it's April 23rd. And then we'll have a get together in uh, end of May with, well, with, we're also working with CESA, the Western Mass by local that has had such success over the last 10 years. It's a million dollar business uh, if you look at the balance sheet. Um, so we're going to have meetings with them to help them share with us. So it's a little bit of the leapfrog thing that we started six months ago, but we'll jump 10 years. If we share with them, so you're pretty close to the book you ended up coming out. That, that's a top flight thing that came out. Oh right, yeah, this, I mean we have to credit all of us that jumped into this thing. It really worked. Yeah, it, it worked. It, well, and again, we we have that success because of what we learned, and then we jumped a little ahead of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So here's the secret. What's the guy? You'll love this one little secret. The secret is that CISA had their annual meeting, and they put a financial report out. And so with us. It was, well, when are we gonna, when would we like a lot of business, right? Would we like to have a lot of business like starting like right now or into the early part of the season? We would. So our book was out in March. Their book isn't out yet. Won't be out until May. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our dirty, dirty, dirty little <laughs> secret. So anyway, any questions, let me know. But please take books away. Even Rutland, take some books away. Put them in your uh, town offices and the like. But uh, I'm really excited about this. This is good stuff. Get them into libraries. Yes. A lot of people Good point. The town offices, but they do go into libraries. Good point. Good point. Back to you. Thank you. And at one of our other meetings, we discussed how um, ag comms can help promote, support promote this whole um, Worcester County Central Mass grown. So we can continue those discussions. Um, 
as far as uh, as our group here, our Worcester County AgCom group was sharing information amongst the AgComs. We did this and this helped that, and that's part of what this group is about: is to share um, our successes and also our difficulties with getting information out with programs such as this. Um, I also like Mike. If you want to speak a few minutes about the Massachusetts Association of Agriculture Commissions, they had their annual meeting. Was it in February? So I like, if you just want, I mean, I'm not sure what happened there or what didn't happen, yeah. but <laughs> but if you just want to report on that, because I think that was brought up at the January meeting. We had our Massachusetts Association Ag Commission meeting held in conjunction with Harvest New England in Sturridge, the Sturridge Coast Hotel, and we failed to get a quorum of Ag Commissions to be able to conduct business at the end of the meeting. Yes, February was a terrible month with weather and whatnot. Um, we have some communications issues um, between the association and AgComs um, that we're discussing and trying to get moving forward with. Um, we presently have a lack of a secretary, so we're looking forward to having somebody jump forward and say they want to be a secretary. They have to be also they have to be on the board of directors as well. So. All this is going to have to take place at the next annual meeting to get us back on board. Everything is 501c3 and just a few things that we need to clean up. But we need more involvement from all of the AgComs. We presently have 64 AgComs out of 167 that are members of the association. There's no cost to be a member of the association at present. So if you're not a member of Mass Ag Comms, I'd like you to step forward and jump on board. We just, uh, Worcester County's new rep is Jerry Kristoff from the Rutland Ag Commission. Uh, I served as the county rep until I became the vice president a couple years ago. I guess that's about what I've got to say. All right. Thank you. So yeah, the, that, that association is what, probably two years, two or three years old, yeah, something years. like that, or maybe three or four. So it's a young organization, but it does need input um, from all the ag commissions across the state. So if, I mean, nobody wants another meeting to go to, I'm sure, but uh, it, it is a worthwhile organization that's worthy of, and most of our getting some energy towards it. Thank you, Mike. Are there any other topics that um, we discussed in the past that anybody wants to update the group on? Okay, hearing none. What we like to do since we're, it's a sort of new for us to have um, different towns host us, but we would like to have the Brookfield um, Ag Commission, if you can give us you know, a five or 10 minute report on some of the things that you're doing in your town. Um, share some information about what your commission is doing. Um, that would be great. So when we adjourn, so you guys can go back uh, up to the North Country for the hour drive that you, got, that you have before you, so we won't keep you here. Uh, but we're, we're going to have a, a meeting of what we're going to do. We're going to talk about our farmer's market this year, whether we go or not go, for the simple reason we've got a number of sh uh, shops that are actually taking the material. Next door is Tip Top. They're taking a bunch of stuff from different people. Um, and, and others have just gone into different markets, and their stuff is being used up, which is you know, where we were three years ago. The stuff is being sucked up, and that's all good. So we'll talk about farmer's market tonight. But now the next step is education. And we're going to talk about a pumpkin contest where we'll give some seeds away, give some compost away, and see if we can get some pumpkins going. Because if anybody had a pumpkin muffin tonight, those were grown in Brookfield. And we're going to teach kids how to bake muffins or pumpkin pie or whatever it is. But that, those pumpkins were grown in the fall, and they're available for use today. No, I'm a residential kitchen, but anyway, hopefully no one will get ill. I cook them. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, the pump will get maybe something going with the schools with education. And again, our, our series, and I told you about it as we kicked off, we, we did the egg thing, which we thought was really great. And again, a bunch of uh, views of other people looking at the eggs. Uh, we'll next month do forestry. So third Wednesday of next month, same time, same place, we have the regional forester uh, that will be here. 
And one of my personal things based on, based on forestry is just to the south of us is the Plimpton Community Forest. It's uh, 295 acres in Sturbridge, 26 acres in, in Brookfield. Uh, Mass uh, Wildlife is actually going to take the chunk that's in Brookfield and take it and be it. It's going to be part of a wolf swamp preservation area within Brookfield area. But what it will do with the town of Sturbridge taking over that land, it will be a continuous 2,700 acres of green in central Massachusetts. So I'm really excited about that. But how we got to this point is we educated the owner on the subject of forests and, and uh, well, tax credit 61A. We informed him about that. He moved in that direction. And then there was an opportunity with the land trust to take the land or acquire the land or transfer it to the town. Uh, it's $1.7 million. We found $800,000 in grants. And we're hopeful that the town of Sturbridge in June at their town meeting will vote 658,000 to do the last chunk to preserve those 295 acres. Why is that important to forestry? Because the town of Sturbridge will have the opportunity to forest that, let, that forest because we got him into a forest program that he has harvested on the land. And with that, he made a bunch of money, but the town can perpetually now make money on in that green forest. So we're, uh, I'm personally very excited about that, but it's only through the education of the folks in this room from Brookfield who educated me on the, the, the whole tax deal and, and the like. So anyway, that's where, where Brookfield is. We're busy, aren't we guys and girls? There, thank you. And you certainly have a room full of people. I'm impressed. <laughs> What's this? What, you guys were talking about FISMA earlier? FISMA. Yeah. Well, you, it was mentioned. I'm not going to say we talked about it, but it was mentioned. Yeah, yeah. what's, 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 uh, was there something new going on with that? Something getting kicked around? And, I don't, it? so it's a Food Safety Modernization Act, mm -hmm. and it, I, I don't, I can't report on this. Does anybody have Does anybody any? know anything about it? It has a 2015 date on it that it's going to be enacted. I believe it's October. I, I heard it's, it's Someone with potential nightmare. Is that true? Or oh, oh yes. Yeah. So yeah. Like, so uh, how, shouldn't that be like? Should we be discussing some stuff like that, like Brocco? That's a real deal. Yeah. You know. I, I don't know about anything about it. I I, I, I caught wind of this and I'm like, what? We need to. Seventeen hundred pages. Well, I'll take it. We get the commissioner tomorrow morning, noon, at twelve to thirty. I'll ask the question. There you go. All right. Yes. You might not yeah. know much because it's a federal thing. That's okay. You're going to ask me. It is a good yeah. question. I mean, it's one of those, you, we, you need to educate yourself, and there are people who know the answers to the questions. Um, sometimes you got to figure out if you want to ask the question, because it's, it's going to be a, an interesting and I think somewhat difficult situation with small producers, because a lot of the regulations are going to require money. and. I don't know if you can beg, borrow, or steal, you know, forgiveness for that because. What, what is it even going to do? What are they going? What are they going to restrict us on everything or what? Oh, I mean, is it? A, yeah, it's looking up on the internet, it's huge. And it's it's a lot of paper. I mean, there's paperwork, paperwork, the HACCPs, you know, things that are going to be required, which um, I it's very. I mean, a lot of the tasks they just need to be done, and they're not. But if you're busy doing lots of other things, as many of us are, to now have to dedicate somebody to do this paperwork is difficult. And that's where, I mean, I'm, so I said I'm a cheesemaker. I've been getting for the past, I'm going to say, month, at least two emails a day saying, sign up for, you know, we'll come do your HACCP plan for you. We'll come do this for you. We'll come test that for you. You know, always a dollar sign behind it. But I'm getting these. You know, there's companies out there that are, are pushing it because they know that it's coming through. So that's the smart thing. If you want to be involved with it, go create a business that charges other people money. And the exemption situation is such a low number. $25,000 annually is basically the cutoff for being exempt from it. So you can't survive with $25,000 a year. Has this already, is this already a done deal? Yeah. Has it been voted on in yeah, it has process? a, I believe it's an October date where it's, but it's a stage thing, it rolls in, and small guys are going to have almost, I think it's eight years before you fully have to be. We'll find a way around it by then. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's, and that's the thing, you follow up, because it's changing. Every time you turn around, 
That's one of this the language that's being put in or pulled out or you know reduced. So where we're at, it's I mean every day I read something different about FISMA. Yeah, it's but it's scary. And we can, t I mean, maybe as for our group here, maybe we can look at that for a future topic like next January when some of us have time to rest and put our brains into something requiring more work of us. But it's, it's something it's I think. It's game one now. <laughs> real work. Um, which leads us to our next discussion is, well, we won't do that. Um, networking time. We did a little bit, we learned about what the Brookfield Ag Commission is doing, do other commissions sitting here want to share. I'll share from Sterling. We're going to have um, a chapter lands meeting, chapter 61 land meeting um, next Monday, April 20th at 7 p.m. at the Sterling um, Parish Hall, the church right in the center at our common. So it's going to be, we have Brad Mitchell from Farm Bureau who's going to discuss the chapter 61 land um, tax benefits whatever. So if you want to learn more about chapter lands, um, both for forestry and agriculture, I encourage you to attend our meeting next Monday, April 20th at 7 p.m. at the First Church Parish Hall. Any other, any other news from the Ag Commission sitting here? We voted two more, Tell them voted two more uh, onto our Ag Board, so we're more to five now. Good. We bumped up. Are you right to five? Yes. I have been, yeah, for quite a while. So we went up from three to five. Good. So. It rounds out your board. Yeah, well, we, we had a couple of, you know, we had some, um, you know, I swear, from different sections. We've got an apple guy now. And, you know, we weren't just meat and farmers and, uh, you know, we got a little everything kind of. That's good. You know. Why is your base? Yeah. Right. Congratulations. So. I know it's not always easy. <laughs> and we, we didn't, it didn't take much. It's like, like, sure. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll share. Um, so on that subject, um, we, at our last time meeting, we added two alternates. So we're up to five members and five alternates. Um, so we have a pretty sizable extra count. Um, and our biggest project right now that we're working on, one of our elements of That's very exciting. And did the AGCOM help fund that at all, or no, how? We're in the process of funding it, but yeah. And will you set up, um, like, because it's part of the school, so will you help do education with, will there be some AGCOM interaction with the children with it? Yeah, yeah, we, um, we coordinate planting. We have there's like graders in the existing, uh, existing greenhouse that we have. Um, and so the greenhouse that we're working on now is going to be more grades three through five. And so we're working on working with math like in the classroom and trying to get some of those curriculum phases um, into the school, but hopefully for us as well to get in there. That's great. Yeah. Congratulations. That's been a, that's been a vision for a little while, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see it come to fruition. Anybody else? Okay, and I forgot. I say, it yeah, but sure, what about those bills? What were those two bills that sure went strong? Do you know, Mike, the two bills that are. One is that one that. I'll find it. If you do, what we're going to do. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't do all my homework for the meeting tonight. Uh, so let's, we're going to, our next quarterly meeting, we normally try to discuss within our group, um, the meeting would be in June. So if the group wants to meet in June, we need to decide on a date, we need to decide on where and a topic. So what's the consensus amongst the group for a meeting in June? June is a lousy month. June's a lousy month. And if we want to stop, we don't need to meet in June, if we want to look at doing it, something, we've done this in the past, but we don't meet in the summer. And we pick up again like in October or something like that. Um, I think that's what we did last year. Is we met maybe we started meeting again in October. So if, if the group wants to do that, we can choose to wait, meet in October. We need to escape from the farm in June. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not sure that I do, but <laughs> Mike Skip is on the farmer's market. I think it's called the bar. <laughs> Only three left. 
What's what's the group say? <laughs> want to meet in June? Want to wait? You're shaking your head, Dick. What's that mean? Skip. Skip. One vote for skip. And skip. Okay. I'm Okay. All right, Mike, you're going to have to go have a milkshake by or something. <laughs> I'll put you to work. You can come to my farm. I'll put you to work. Um, how about October then? You want to do something in October? Yeah. October sounds good. Any? Templeton, would you like to host us? No. Not yet. Okay. Rutland will host us? Okay, and so what day, what, what day of the week, or we can get back on that, but do you guys want to do it with, as part of your meeting, or you want to have a special thing, or? I love that part. Okay. <laughs> so we'll, we'll plan on October. We don't, we normally do it on Wednesdays. Um, we meet on Tuesdays, so Wednesdays is fine. Okay. Okay, and is there a topic that Someone wants to bring to the ta the floor? Maybe by then you might know something about FISMA. Yeah, FISMA. Yeah, yeah. FISMA. That would be good. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, gotta, I mean, we can't bounce off this stuff. We've got to no, at least start taking our heads together. Yeah. OK, that, that's one. Can Let's just have a. We can pull somebody out of the How about someone talking about the public market? What's going on with the public market? It's by then. Yeah, Ryan, put Ryan McKay on it. He'll talk in front of anybody. <laughs> so that's could, just another topic could, would be kind of what's going on with the public market. Could we broaden that and talk about farmers markets in general? By then we're all exhausted with them, so we're, we have all kinds of things to talk about. <laughs> but that might be a good topic and then have the Boston public, because that doesn't apply to everybody, but perhaps we could have a, a meeting about that type of farmers market in general and have a segment about the Boston public market. Sure. Does, does that sound like, because it's going to be October, we've been through most of the season for farmers markets. And um, the other thing you might want to do is look, there's, at least Westminster is getting more and more pressure to come up with a winter market, which I'm existing mightily, um, because I have to, have to run it and I have no interest in running it in the winter. I hear you. Um, but there is now pressure for carrying through the winter. So that's something else that needs to get looked at. Okay. So that's two topics and I want to talk to Dawn Tarn that she's done one the last year. I'm not running it and nobody else is thinking yeah, it. So it's, it's, a, it's a non deal to me, but <laughs> it's an issue that needs to get talked over. All right, so there's quite a few topics and if we don't do it's a matter of getting someone who knows something about to, to talk um, with the I, I really have trouble calling it FISMA myself, but um, the Food Safety Monitoring Check. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll keep that on the agenda, and I can, I'll work on trying to find a speaker um, for that topic. But we can go with either one of those. I'm kind of steering towards the markets, but I think it'll be a good time. We can talk about the winter ones, and then try to get a FISMA somebody for maybe January, but we'll, I think that's a great topic. So we'll see how those two go. And we have a lady that's on our board with us that wasn't able to be here tonight, Carrie. What's her last name? Novak. Novak, and she does a lot. And she, she works with she's USDA. USDA. Yeah, yeah, so she she might be willing to speak on that. She was the one that actually asked us to come down here tonight. She sure. thought that was on the topic for some reason. But um, we'll, I'll talk to Carrie, and okay. she probably has your email information, I would think. Yeah, yeah yes. Yeah, so she might be someone who can do that. Okay. That sounds good. Do you want to share those input? You don't have to read it. <laughs> so um, so this, is, this is about the two bills? Well, yeah, she has a couple other things, but did you just want me to ask about that? So Cheryl Ekstrom, who's our Massachusetts Department of Agriculture um, Ag Com Liaison. Ag Thank you, Mike. She wasn't able to make it here tonight, but there were two bills that are being filed at the state level that she wanted us to make the group aware of, and I forgot to take it off. So I'm going to hand the floor to Finney, and she can say what they are. So MAAC, Mass Association of AgComs, um, and some of the AgComs were, were represented at the Ag Day at the State House on the 31st of March. Representative Kate Hogan discussed a bill she's sponsoring called an act to establish municipal ag commissions. And the bill number is HB as a boy 689. 
Also mentioned in the white paper was HB 712, quote, an act to promote farm viability, sponsored by Representative Kulik. Kulik. It would be valuable to have some debate on the bills at an AGCOM meeting and identify consensus. Should the bills pass, what does each Ag Commission need to learn and know to be an effective leader in their community? Please let me know how I may further assist your efforts. Cheryl. Have anybody heard of those two bills? I can speak for you. Oh, great. Thanks, Mike. What they want to do is empower the AgCom similar to conservation commissions so that then the AgComs can be the landholders for APRs and other ag related things and make them more powerful towards regulations that are affecting agriculture within the communities and have a better say than we presently do because we, have, we don't have any state laws behind us at all. We're just simply a home rule petition. Have a badge, no gun. No, I carry guns. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. So, I mean, some, some people aren't happy about thinking about the regulatory side of things, but if we don't have a say in it, then our farmers aren't going to have representation within the municipal government. And that's problematic right now with a lot of things. Whereas your conservation commissions don't have a reality of what's going on with agriculture. And some of them step out of the realm of what conservation is versus preservation. <coughs> I sit on, I'm the vice chair of the Sterling Con Con, um, and I know that for a time many of our board members thought they had a lot more power than they do. So it's identifying responsibilities to these. We had an issue with Templeton, and Brad Mitchell came out and made them all look pretty stupid. Yeah. So <coughs> I, we know what you're talking about. They just, they just kind of went. And, and myself, I preach that uh, if you want things done in town hall, get into town hall and start doing things. We don't have representation on the <coughs> Farmers made this country, made this state, and we're losing it because we're not there. Mm -hmm. I myself sit on, I'm in two elected and 10 appointed capacities for my own town. And then I sit on this board, as well as Worcester County Farm Bureau, and a few other things. So you gotta be involved to be heard move things forward the way we want to work. Otherwise, we're going to be regulated out of our own industry. Amen to that. Do you know if Shrewsbury has a farmer's market? Shrewsbury started a farmer's market last year, which I think is run on Wednesdays. Um, and they're having it again this year. Mm. Well, <clears throat> Whole Foods is taking it over. So I wonder if that's going to hurt. They sometimes I know. sponsor farmers markets. They sometimes invite farmers markets in that's their uh, parking lots. And so, I'm conservation commissioner in Brookfield, and it is kind of interesting to see what people try to pull. That's why I'm on here to make sure that in Brookfield is in trouble. Um, and, and with, as far as Whole Foods coming in, I don't, I mean, they're going to be in their little, I don't think, personally, I don't think it would affect the farmer's market. It may even be able to, people could work with Whole Foods to help encourage the farmer's market. Because Whole Foods is, um, they, they can be good corporate sponsors. We, uh, we have a Massachusetts Cheese Guild, and we just brought um, Whole Foods on as a sponsor. Um, they help fund a project that we're working on as a cheese go. So they can be a good corporate friend. You know, it's, you know, you gotta pay attention to things whenever you involve a corporate sponsor, but there can be some good things that come out of it as well. Excuse me, may I have that house bill again, not the first one? Sure. You mentioned? It'll take me a minute. <laughs> so that one is it's about municipals. I mean, one thing that, you know. Thank you. It is, urban agriculture is kind of a hot topic right now, and a lot of like Worcester, a lot of the cities don't have them, they weren't, correct me when I'm wrong, they weren't, it wasn't legislated that cities could have ag comms or something like this. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's some aspect of that where, like, the urban, but there's a lot of urban farming happening, whether it's um, church parking lots that are being raised bedded and things are growing in it. There's the, you know, in Boston, there's those containers that are doing vertical growing of all kinds of things. So there's a lot of um, urban agriculture happening, and there's not a good representation of the agricultural um, industry and agriculture in those cities. They don't have an agcom. So I think that's part of what perhaps that bill is about. And we talked at our Sterling Agcom meeting um, earlier in April about the Board of Health. Same, similar with the Conservation Commission, you have the Board of Health that may not be aware of um, agricultural issues. And so we are going to work on our, that's one thing we're going to work on in the near future is um, particularly with the food, the food Safety Act and all these other things, helping to work with our Board of Health in understanding agriculture as well. So there's a lot to do. Um, just an idea, like, I'm a grad student at UMass, so I spent some time at Amherst, and I know last month the Amherst ComCom and the AgCom hosted a meeting with the EP to go over those areas where there's overlap. So maybe that's something that you can know, work with more help and get some other agencies involved where you do get everybody in the same room. All right, um, we try to end at eight, so we have like a minute to go. If anybody has any parting words for our group. I'll say one thing. <laughs> I, I sit on the uh, subcommittee for the planning board in Rutland, and I had all I could do to get my arm kicked out of the dog bill, you know, and uh, I just couldn't believe it. But we got it out of there anyways, and I pushed like crazy because of the right to farm by law. It's out. So, so anybody, you know, we get on these boards once in a while and just uh, keep an eye on it because things are slipping in. You shouldn't. Thank you. Good job. All right, so we'll, uh, Lisa Toronto, anybody who wants to be added to our email list, um, do you know what Lisa's, it's, well, we'll just well, I'll give you. There's a context warrant on that, so if you uh, would like to be um, added to the email list that announces this county, thank you, the county um, AgCom meetings, just go ahead and bring your name on it. Anybody want to be added? Yeah, uh, that's how we found out about it. We could put okay. this. We could put the list on the back table with. So when you pick up all your things, your your books and bumper stickers. You can um, sign up, put your email there, and Lisa will add you to our email list, and then you'll get the reminders and the information. Um, Lisa's really great about sending, getting that list put out. So um, thank everybody for attending this evening. Thank you to Brookfield AgCom for hosting us. Thank you. And it's great to have you. Thank you very much. Great. And so what we'll do is I'll let you watch. Because we're still going back to our regular order. Brookfield, we're still going back to our regular order at 8.15. Whoa, slow down, guys. This is important. There's food on that back table. you got a road to go. Grab some food on your way out of town, all right? Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thanks for coming. Look forward to seeing you soon.